Cube is down 14% over the last six months and looks to be undervalued by the market. This could be some significant opportunity to add this company into your portfolio. It is towards the 52-week low with an incredibly strong forward yield of 5.1%. And in today's episode, we're going to take a look and see if this share price can be doubled or tripled over the next few years alongside seeing a very nice yield on cost in double digits. So it is down 14% year to date. We're going to take a look at the historical performance of the company. We're going to jump into their income statements, looking at that top line revenue growth year on year, as well as that bottom line net income. We're going to take a look at the health of the balance sheet and look at their cash versus their total debt. This in turn is going to lead us to that all important dividend safety and some very important financial metrics you need to understand before investing in CubeSmart, especially if you believe a recession is looming. As always, we are going to run it through our stock valuation model, getting to our intrinsic value and our acceptable buy price given our margin of safety. Now, CubeSmart down 14% year to date. And whilst it is at the 52 week low or towards that, we always say 52 week low never signals undervaluation. Likewise, 52 week high never signals overvaluation. Now, a forward yield of 5.1%. And with this dividend growth that we're about to analyze, it looks to be an incredible opportunity to invest in this company. Now, shareholders who have been investing in CubeSmart over the last 10 years would have seen a 110% gain on the share price, excluding those dividends reinvested. So today we want to understand, is it a buy now at what price and what growth can we see both on the share price as well as that yield? Now, in terms of their top line, what we like to see around 5 to 10% growth year on year, 2018, 597 million, and just under double that over the next five years, December 2022, their latest annual report reporting just over 1 billion on the top line and what's nice to see is we can see every single year that line has gone up that top line so very positive to see the consistency we will shortly look at the top line 10 years percentage wise now the bottom line how has that fared well 164 million on the bottom line the net income in 2018 latest annual report 291 million so again it has gone up as well in line with the revenue but on a more granular level we can see it's gone up very slightly in 2019 and then has come down in 2020 but then has picked up so very small inconsistencies but overall looking fairly positive on the income statement now balance sheet quick health check what i like to do is compare total cash versus total debt around 4 million held in 2018 latest quarterly report from a few weeks ago they hold around 9 million so nearly three times as much cash sitting on that balance sheet today versus the last five years. And when we take a look at that total debt position, 1.75 billion in December 2018, around 3 billion in their latest quarterly report. So they are holding a significant amount more of total debt than they did five years ago. And that fast and outpaced the growth in cash. So what will be interesting to see is the dividend safety and supporting financial metrics. And what we can see here, dividend safety score of 61, market cap just shy of 9 billion, making a mid cap company. Now, for those who believe we're heading into a recession, let's look at a few of these metrics. Recession dividends So the last recession, 0709, they in fact cut the dividend. Recession sales, it was around minus 9%. But as we can see, this was the average growth rate of companies in the S&P 500 during 0709. Now, shockingly, we can see the recession return negative 88% in the last recession on that share price return is incredibly poor, trailing the S&P 500 by negative 55% from the 0709 period for companies in the S&P 500. So again, do bear that in mind. That is quite a phenomenally poor metric. But as always, historical performance does not dictate future performance. Now, moving on to dividend growth. And what do we love to see as dividend growth investors? Double digit increases. And wow, December 2022. So we are due a dividend increase soon. 14% increase. Last five years, 10%. Last 10 years, 18%. So incredible double digit growth. Phenomenal. And as we can see, they have been paying increasing dividends for the last 13 years. As I always say, and this is more important for the viewers who are new to the channel, always aim for 4% minimum in your dividends. 
other income producing assets and salary because 4% was the average inflation rate in the US over the last 40 years. Anything less, you are taking a pay cut and losing your purchasing power. Now, dividend yield theory states that the company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five-year average. As we can see here, 5.1 versus 4.05. We have one sign of undervaluation, but as always, we never look at any model in isolation and we'll draw a conclusion towards the end of the episode. Forward P to AFFO ratio, again, 15 versus 19.8, another sign of undervaluation. And when we take a look at the sector P to AFFO, cube smart coming in slightly higher at 15 versus the real estate average of 12.8. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, it is trading towards the 52 week low. But as always, 52-week low does not signal undervaluation. 52-week high does not signal overvaluation. Now, typically, we look at the earnings versus free cash flow. And I tell the regular viewers that we tend to ignore earnings due to the fact that earnings is susceptible to manipulation by management through their accounting. However, with REITs, we tend to ignore the free cash flow as it is more volatile. The reason for this is because of upfront rent payments, maintenance expenses and deferred financing costs. So for REITs, we tend to look at the adjusted FFO funds from operation payout. What we typically look for is below 90%. Consistently below that for Cube Smart, we can see here the last few years around 70%. 2023 is expected to go up higher to 77, but again, gives me faith so far that that dividend is safe. Now we move on to the adjusted FFO funds from operations per share. 85 cents in 2013, 253 in 2022, some strong growth over the last 10 years. We can see as well consistent growth some years where it does remain fairly flat, but overall it is going in the right direction. Upwards trajectory, very positive to see. And as we saw earlier, 5 to 10% is what we like to see in terms of growth on the top line. And every single year they have done that or smashed that other than 2020. So very positive to see numerically. 320 million of top line sales in 2013, 1 billion in 2022, more than three times growth on the top line over the last 10 years and very consistent. So very, very positive to see. Shares outstanding. Now I'm going to tell you straight away, I think this is very positive to see. Yes, we love it when companies do share buybacks, returning excess cash to our shareholders. However, with REITs, we tend to see the opposite where they issue shares to fund property acquisitions due to the fact that they retain little of that internally generated cash flow. As we saw, those payout ratios are significantly higher. Now, the reason why I like this is because they aren't increasing their shares at a very fast rate. Bear in mind that an increase of shares essentially means your position as a shareholder is being diluted. So if you do want to take a look, for example, at one of my videos such as Realty Income, ticker symbol O, you'll see they grow their shares at a much faster rate. So in my personal opinion, this is not the worst and is not bad at all. ROIC, Return on Invested Capital, one of my seven golden dividend metrics. If you want to see the other six, check the pin YouTube channel video. The reason why I like 10% plus personally is due to the fact that it means that management are able to effectively allocate their capital. Now, interestingly, with REITs, we typically see between 3 to 5%. So I would say on the whole, this is very positive to see. We are seeing around 3 to 5% with the last few years looking significantly better between 5 to 6%. Then we move on to the operating margin. Very positive to see whilst we like to look at around 20% plus, we can see for the large part it has been over that and fairly consistent over the last few years. The higher the operating margin, it'll end up having a higher bottom line, that net income, which in, will in turn have a higher dividend payout for the investors. Finally, net debt to earnings for interest tax depreciation amortization, very important, especially as we saw the increase in total debt versus that cash. 5.5 years being the number of years it would take the company to pay off all their debt net of cash on hand. We can see 2020 and 21 being higher than what we'd like. 2022 on a much more positive note has come down with 2023 expected to come down even lower. So very positive to see. Gives me faith again in that dividend safety. And on the right, purely showing the percentage of a company's financing from debt as opposed to equity. As always, if you do enjoy the content, smash that like button, hit that subscribe button. If you are enjoying the content as well as that bell button, if you want to have these videos directly dropped to your doorstep. And as always, if you want to run these companies through your own essential portfolio to get your own acceptable buy prices for your own companies, even on your watch list, do click on the pin description and grab a copy. Now, typically, Graham's valuation would be the first formula that we use. However, regular viewers know that this is inappropriate for REITs and therefore we do not include it. For those that are new, I will briefly run through how it works for the other companies. 
We have our stock ticker cube. We have the earnings per share, growth rate per analyst estimates, as well as that triple yield, well, triple A corporate bond yield, 5.14. So then we'd get our intrinsic value and we'd use that in the final calculation. As mentioned, it isn't appropriate for REITs. So we use our first model, the REITs multiples valuation model, companies in a similar sector and size, public storage, Pelogis, extra space storage, stag industrial. We have their stock price and P to AFO multiple. We have the average P to AFO divided by that of Cube, multiplied by its current price to get a stock price of REITs multiples valuation for Cube at $47. Now, when we take a look, that is significantly higher than the current trading price, showing significant signs of undervaluation and right there at that 52 week high. We then move on to the second model, the dividend discount model. Again, we put the yearly dividends for the specified period. Strong growth over the period, around 10 to 11 percent year on year compounded annual average. Growth rate 4.75 over the long term is what I'm predicting. Again, especially if a recession is looming, you saw how that will affect the ultimate share price of the company and the performance. But as always, if you want to justify a higher or lower percentage, do grab a copy of the model in the pinned description below and run your own figures through based on your own estimates. However, based on my estimates and judgments, this is coming to $63. When we take a look, again, significant upside to the current trading price and above the 52 week high showing signs the market has completely undervalued the price of Cube Smart. We then move on to the third model we're using the free cash flow year on year. We can see the average growth rate forward looking analysts are estimating around 10% with that discount rate. We get the present value of future free cash flows and we add that together with their cash, subtract total debt and arrive at the equity value. Divide that by the shares outstanding to get a DCF price of $53. Again, a more significant upside to the current trading price and above that 52 week high that we've seen not too long ago. Now we get to our intrinsic value, which is the average of the three models we have just discussed. And as always, if you do enjoy the content, hit that like button, do subscribe. It really helps the channel and drop your comments through as we're going through the information. Now, intrinsic value coming to $54.26. Current price around $38. Typically, margin of safety, I'd use 10% if it had a wide moat, strong financial metrics and good forward-looking data. However, with CubeSmart, I think you could justify a higher percentage than 10%, especially if you believe a recession is looming. For those who are looking at 20%, your acceptable buy would be up to $43. For those looking at 25%, up to $40 to $41. And those who are looking at 30%, which I believe you could justify, you'd be looking at roughly the current trading price at around $38. As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Are you looking to add Cube to your portfolio, looking to sell, or purely on the sidelines speculating? As we can see here, Wall Street are forecasting the price to go up to around $48.50 over the next 12 months. And as we can see, they essentially believe it will go back up to the 52-week high that we have seen for the company. Now, understandably, with the recession, with the interest rates increasing and the effect that this will have on the loans that these companies hold, it could push these stocks lower and lower. However, due to the fact that no one can time the market, dollar cost average could be your best friend. As always, though, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you do want to get to your own intrinsic value for companies in your portfolio, do click the link description in the pinned comment and grab yourself a copy. As always, have a great day. Catch you on the next episode and take care.